This is Colin Gray from the thepodcasthost.com and you're listening to Jane Jackson Careers. Well, hello and welcome back to my careers podcast where I interview fascinating professionals who've made amazing career changes. Now, today I'm very lucky to have Rachel White on the show. And Rachel is the CFO for high tech startups in Australia. And with her solid financial and commercial management background in companies, including Sun Microsystems and the Goodman Group, she thrives on building sustainable business models for all types of businesses, especially those in the technology sector. Rachel, observes that we are moving into a world where every business will, in some form or another, be a technology business. She combines her commercial experience with her investor relationships to bring the right people in at the right time and bring an idea to life. Over the past 20 years, she has worked in four countries, raised over 20 million in capital, funded four startups and mentored many business owners. So let's welcome Rachel to the show. Thanks, Jane. Great to be here. Yeah, it's lovely to have you here, and I'm looking forward to learning about your career journey. So how about, to kick us off, tell us a little bit about your early days. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, so I I started my career fairly early on. Um, I did an undergraduate program uh, with an accounting firm, um, as I did a a Bachelor of uh, of Commerce with a major in accounting back in the early 90s. Um, in terms of why did I choose that path, there were a few reasons. Um, at school, I was pretty good at maths and economics, um, hated the sciences, so a business degree kind of made the most sense. Um, and I have a very, very broad streak of independence um, and the ability to do an undergraduate program and start working early um, and to be able to be financially independent was a very big driver. Um, so many of those things uh, pointed me towards these undergraduate programs with the accounting firms. Um, the other thing, I was, I was pretty aware very early on that whilst accounting is not a career that children mention at school in show and tell of what they want to do when they grow up, um, it was very much a field that could lead to many, many other things and especially in business. Um, I had that sense when I was 18 and I've, I, I've never been proven wrong on that one. Mm. Having a f- solid financial background is so important, especially when later on you may transition into your own entrepreneurial ventures. And so now you've mentioned in your bio that you've worked in four different countries. So Mm -hmm. you're from Australia and then your career has obviously taken you around the world. So can you tell us a little bit about that career journey? Yeah, sure. So as I said, I did my undergraduate degree and then I did my CPA exams. Uh, That took me through to about the age of 24 um, at that point, I desperately wanted to travel, um, and so I moved to London and did the standard two-year Antipodean thing um, over there, and that was when I really learned the value of my accounting degree and my CPA qualification in terms of gaining lucrative employment um, in the UK as a contractor. Uh, that was actually where I joined um, Sun Microsystems to backfill a maternity leave um, for eight months, and I ended up staying with that company for seven years. Um, but yeah, so I had two years in the UK all up. Um, where I did a lot of contract work um, and then I did a lot of travelling around and I saw a lot of stuff in Europe and did lots of lots of really interesting things and that's an experience for which I'll always be grateful. Um, so when I, I joined Sun Microsystems as a permanent employee, I came back here to Australia. Uh, I had an Asia-Pacific role um, and so that meant I was travelling in Asia all the time. Um, I was one of those people uh, for whom when you asked where I lived, it was 747, seat 37B. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think I did about a million kilometres across 10 years and a lot of that was through work. Um, yeah, so I spent a lot of time up in Asia. I didn't live there, um, but I, I spent, I did a gazillion biz- business trips to Japan, to Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, um, and even one to New Zealand. Um, so, and then obviously the, the headquarters was in California and so I spent a fair bit of time over there as well. Um, so that took me through from, uh, I came home to Australia in 2000, in 2002, um, they moved me to their corporate headquarters in Silicon Valley. Um, and so I was there from 02 to 05 and that was fascinating. Um, again, as an expat, but this time as a corporate expat as opposed to a backpacker. Um, I travelled all through America. I've been to South America. When I was in Europe, I went to Africa as well. So I've been to just about every continent except Antarctica. Um, but, yeah, so I spent three years in California. Um, I learned just how unhomogeneous the United States really is. Uh, the word united is actually quite loose. 
Um, so it's it's California itself has its own culture. New York has its own culture. The Midwest has its own culture. They're all very, very unique and very different. Um, and I've actually been quite grateful for that experience of living in America because we kind of get a lens of the U.S. Um, through the media and through television and whatnot, which is probably about 50% accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I did that for three years. Um, in 05, I came back to Australia still with Sun. I had an Asia-Pacific role again, did a lot of travel that year. Um, I was very senior uh, within the finance structure by that time uh, and I had a choice to make, which was to either, as my mentor said to me, Rachel, you can stay here in the US for the sake of your career or you can go home and sort your life out, which which is it. Uh, And that was very much a defining moment um, to come back here to Australia. Um, So at the end of 2006, I left Sun Microsystems um, and I went to... Um, hotel club um, and I was their CFO for 12 months um, whilst they were owned by a private equity firm in New York and then they publicly listed during that time on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, That in itself is quite a momentous story in my career which was one of those where you learnt from where things went wrong which I'm sure you'll ask me later. Um, But I think during that period, so it was from 98 through to about 2007, I travelled extensively. I was an absolute nomad um, and I did about a million kilometres um, in the air uh, during that time. So I have, I've had a career that's meant I've seen the world. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> like a fascinating, fascinating career and very, very varied as well. Indeed. And so, and so having travelled really all over the world and worked in your financial capacity, which, which location did you enjoy the most? I think I, I look at it by region. So in Asia, Japan is my favourite place, hands down. Um, in, in Europe, I'd say probably Amsterdam followed by London. Um, London is a, London I actually feel at home in. I've spent enough time there that I don't feel like a foreigner. I don't feel like a traveler. I actually, I'm 20,000 kilometers from home, but I feel, I absolutely feel at home there. Um, San Francisco in America was, was great. Uh, I love New York. I couldn't live there. Um, the, the fact they do construction work at three in the morning would drive me mad. Um, but yeah, so in terms of where my favorite place on earth is, I mean, I had the option to live just about anywhere. I had office in Singapore and Tokyo and to stay in America and then back in London again. Um, I chose here, uh, Sydney is my home. Um, and so I've chosen to make it work here. Uh, cause so, so Sydney is my favorite place on earth. Mm-hmm. I have to agree with you as well. Actually, we share a lot of favourite places in common because I'm, I'm actually from Hong Kong. I okay. love it. And um, anywhere in Asia is, is very appealing to me. And I spent about 18 years in Singapore as well. Okay. And of course, in London too. But Sydney is just a wonderful place to live. Now, back to you, though. Mm-hmm. So with your career, you came back to Australia. And was that in about 2007? No, it was 2005. 2005, okay. And so then you had a number of years back in Australia. And then how did your career progress once you came home? Um, So I was pretty clear once I got back to Australia that I actually didn't have a good network here in Sydney. Um, And Sydney, as you say, it's a beautiful town. Um, And whilst there's huge value in travelling, it's funny, there's there's a, a transition process when you get back, I think, that catches a lot of people out. Um, Because you don't have an extensive network here because you've not spent time building relationships here. Um, So basically from about 2005 when I came home to Australia, I was still travelling extensively. Between then and about 2008, I basically had to build a network here um, to to build an effective career here. Um, So that had several stages. So there was 12 months at Sun once I got home and that was when I realised just how disconnected I was from from the the, the Sydney... um, recruitment market effectively or the jobs market, um, mainly because I'd spent most of my time overseas. Um, I then, as I mentioned before, had a role where I took a financial controller role at Hotel Club um, and the, the issue I alluded to before was I didn't so much get promoted as the, the, the head of finance position basically became open due to circumstances and I was the person there and I kind of fell into it. Um, and it was the classic case of making a career jump too early. I had the technical st- skills. I didn't have the life experience. Uh, so that was why that one was only 12 months. Um, I then, uh, when I left there, I, that was when I jumped into Goodman Property Group and I was their group financial controller from 2008 through 2010. Um, the reason behind that uh, choice to actually go from technology into property, because that sounds most unusual, 
um, was all the calls I was getting from recruiters was, I've got this great job for you here in Sydney, Rachel, where you can then move to Singapore afterwards. It's like to take the head of Asia Pacific Finance uh, in a technology group. And it's like, yeah, I've kind of already done that. Um, so I was looking for an industry that had real breadth here in Australia and clearly property does. Um, and so that, that was my intention. And so I actually worked with a recruiter who I'd gotten to know during that 2005 through 2008 period that I've done a lot of work with. Um, and he's, it's, it's funny. It, it, you know how people say people follow the recruiter, the individual, not the actual recruitment firm? That's mm. very true. I follow this guy everywhere because um, we did build up a very strong relationship. I was his maverick candidate. So you know many recruiters put in, they'll put in four people of whom three fit the brief and one's the maverick. I was the maverick. Um, and I, I managed to attract their attention enough at uh, Goodman to, to solve a, an immediate problem they have because it wasn't anything to do with property. It was to do with reporting and, and integrity of information and that sort of stuff. And I had that in spades and I managed to convince the CFO of that in about 10 minutes and so I got the job. That's basically how it worked. Um, so I'm very, very glad of that experience because it gave me ASX listed. So I ended up working for a company that was publicly listed in my own country as opposed to being a multinational subsidiary. So I got to see the other side um, in, in within the, the finance profession. Uh, the finance profession is so enormous that there's lots and lots of streams. And so this this absolutely filled a very big gap on my resume. Um the other, the other side of it, of course, was I jumped into an industry about which I knew very little. I didn't know very many people um, and also just culturally wasn't a good fit for me. Um, property is, they think in 10 and 20 year cycles. Um, you build a building, you're going to rent it out for 50 years. You know, it's, so it's very long term. So therefore change is very slow. Um, and the adaptability thing, it just isn't there. Um, whereas in tech, uh, 10 years time is, is a millennia. Um, in terms of what technology will look like in 2026, it will bear no resemblance to you, know, you and I having this conversation on Skype will look positively antiquated. Um, so um, there was a restructure. They offered me a role. Um, I actually said no. Um, so I took the redundancy and actually took the opportunity to go freelancing and to take a very different path. Mm. Yeah, what a fascinating story. You know, ah. there are two, two questions I'd like to ask you. One, sure. is, one is about you returning home after being overseas for a long time. What do you think? Is it an advantage or a disadvantage being Australian, going overseas, gaining all of that international experience and then coming back here? Because I have clients who for some say it's a positive experience, for some say it's a massive challenge. What do you think? Like everything else in life, it's what you choose to make of it. Um, I think what that 10 years travelling gave me was an enormous more enormous depth of experience in different cultures in how things are done but also what is actually common between us all. Um, so the issues they have in the UK and the issues we have here and the issues they have in California, they're all the same issues. Cash is king. That doesn't change wherever you go. Um, obviously the tax rules do. Um, and some of the local, you know, some of the local regulations obviously are different, but the concepts on which they are built are actually very, very similar. Um, so I think it gives you confidence in your ability to jump into a situation and, and deal with stuff, um, mainly because once you've done it in another country, you will figure it out um, if you see what I mean. And so settling back into Australia and thinking about how to grow your networks again, and, and you said that it was limited because you had been away for a long time, how challenging did you feel that was? At the time, enormously challenging because I was at a stage in my life where I actually didn't put huge value on relationships. I thought my knowledge, skills and experience should be enough. Um, I think in your late 30s, and I, I, I hit this with a bit of a thud. Um, was the realisation that the issues I was having in my career had nothing to do with my skills, ability and, and merit and experience or lack of it. Um, it was all about building those relationships. Um, and so I think once I started to value that a lot more, it actually got a lot easier. Um, from a timing viewpoint, yes, that happened at the time that I left corporate and went freelancing. Uh, and clearly, to be an effective freelancer, you really do have to focus on those relationships. Um, your skills and experience is only 50% of the, of the picture. Um, but I think I, I know I had to learn to value that, um, those relationships and just being a familiar and known quantity and how much that impacted decision making and to not take it personally. Um, when I was not making headway, even though I knew what I was doing, sort of thing. 
And I think that's because that's not spoken about in interviews. Obviously, interviews are all meant to be merit based. I learned that they're not. Um, so it's almost this element that's very hidden, and you've kind of got to figure out for yourself. Um, but once I did figure that piece out, that that this was around just being familiar in a known quantity and the relation, the very relational elements of business decision making, it all got a lot easier because I, I just I realised that you know it is that classic acceptance thing. It's like okay, this is how it works. So I need to learn how to do this as opposed to fighting it. Mm. I think mm. when it comes to mm. interviews and what people are actually looking for. Of course, you know, the skills and the knowledge are important and your willingness to be able to work in the way that the company would like you to, whether it's, you know, a lot of international travel or local travel or whatever it might be. But would you say that fit is the most important thing? It's really fitting into the culture um, and also being a good fit with whoever your manager might be. I think both of those are very much symptomatic of, of the, the relational elements. Um, the culture of a company is effectively the relationships, the, the interactions people have within that structure. Um, and, and obviously that's set by the person at the top. But uh, obviously a lot of cultures just end up resembling their, their personality effectively. So, yeah, I think it's in terms of, and especially later in your career, um, obviously in your 20s you're learning your craft, you're learning your trade. Um, and so the merit and experience-based stuff is well and truly sufficient. Um, that was my experience anyway. But, yeah, I think it's once you get to your mid-30s, that starts to change. Um, you've learnt your stuff, you know what you're doing. Um, it, is, it is, at that point, it is about being effective in getting stuff done and the only way you can do that is to build relationships with other people. Um, and so, obviously, the culture of the company and your relationship with your boss is very symptomatic of, of the need to put that, as, uh, that, those relationships at front and centre. Mm. And how about transitioning industries? Because you had quite a strong focus on the, the high tech, the technology sector, and then moving into property, obviously, you're focusing more on the financial and the commercial side of things. But did you find it was uh, quite a challenge to change industries? Or was it quite an easy ride for you? Um, so I took a role where I was playing to my strengths, and I didn't actually need in, um, experience in the property sector. Uh, and I was fortunate that there was a CFO who recognised that, um, even though he'd spent most of his life um, in the property sector. Um, so I think that there was a transitional element there. Where I started to run into problems was there's a whole language around the um, the share and equity markets and funds management, uh, which was just actually very unfamiliar to me. Um, and so it was just... How do you integrate into a culture when you don't understand their language effectively? Um, so the basics around financial management and business management and being commercial and managing a team and all that sort of stuff was was all fine. Um, but, yeah, where, where I – and so to do, to do the job I was hired to do was not a problem. It was to progress beyond it. Um, it was almost like an industry will have its own language and it's very tribal in many respects because it's w whether you know the language is whether an indication of whether you're in, in or outside the tribe. Um, and it was, it was acknowledging that um, that I think was, was pretty key. So I think if you're going to change industries, what I, because I, I, as I said before, the role before Goodman, I was, I was, you know, in over my head. So I very deliberately stepped back into something where I was very comfortable with the content of the role. Um, and use that to make the transition. And it was very effective in, in the job I was hired to do. Um, but, yes, it was making progress beyond that. That was where I started running into problems. So when I went freelancing, I went back to the technology sector. Mm. And obviously the technology sector is where your heart is as well. So tell us more about your business now and being CFO for high-tech startups. How does it work? And tell us a little bit about your journey into this entrepreneurial venture. Sure. Yeah. So when I when I um, when they were doing a restructure at Goodman, um, I realised I needed to take a different approach. Um, the analogy I came to mind at the time was because I had got stuck. Um, was the water goes around the rock in a river? The water doesn't try and go through the rock. I was trying to go through the rock. So the freelancing for me was going around the water going around the rock. Uh, and so it was a bit of a dive into the unknown, but I was clear at the time I needed to, I had that emphasis to do some things in a different way um, and not to keep trying to do things the way I'd done them before. 
And that realization that the issues I was running into had nothing to do with my skills and experience was actually really helpful um, in making that transition. Um, so I didn't have a clear view of what I was going to do as a freelancer when I left. And I said to the CFO at the time, Ed Goodman, was, look, I'm not looking to get another full-time job somewhere else. Um, I'm happy to support this transition without a job description effectively. Um, take the redundancy and then if you want me to stick around as a consultant for a while, that, that's fine. Um, and so that was what I did. Um, and so basically I actually worked with them as a consultant for six months and that gave me the, the financial time. So I didn't have the, that enormous financial pressure to get a new business model that I didn't really know up and running. It gave me time to explore. Um, that was that was handy. Um, so during that time, then the virtual uh, CFO concept had started to appear. This was early 2011. Um, it's a concept that's pretty well established in England, uh, in particular. Um, it uh, was gaining traction at the time in the United States. It was somewhat embryonic here, uh, where as a virtual CFO, you basically jump into a company and perform the CFO role, but part time. Um, they don't need a full-time CFO. They're actually not big enough or complex enough to need a full-time person and obviously can't afford one either. Um, at the same time, the um, early-stage startup technology scene that obviously Malcolm Turnbull referred to last year uh, was starting to emerge. It was still very much in the garage. Um, I affiliated with this accounting firm. Um, at the time, they were called Azure Group, who had a CFO practice, and they had connections into this, into this emerging startup sector. Uh, so I actually got my first gig through them, um, which was for an incubator called Polonizer at the time, um, and I, they just needed some very basic fund management stuff, um, and I did that with them. Um, as is often the case, the board member, one of the board members of Polonizer, was also an investor and board member in a bigger technology company startup, and it was the classic case of, um, yeah, Rachel, they're doing a capital raise right now, and they need a bit of help. Can you go have a look? <laughs> um, and um, I think uh, a Put it this way, we managed to bring the fire down from the crown of the trees. It was about to hit the crown um, but, and it obviously explode. But, you know, so we, we brought it back down to simmering level. Um, I was actually meant to be there for three months. I was there for 18 um, months all up. So and that, was, that was pretty intense. But the point with that was uh, whilst I was probably a bit overbooked, um, nice problem to have as a freelancer, but, you know, the, you learn how to balance the capacity um, issues. Um, I met pretty much every technology investor in Australia because they had all invested in this venture. Um, I realised at the time that it was the investor who was my customer as opposed to the founder because it's the investor who wants me there um, to look after their money. Um, obviously, that doesn't negate the need to build a strong relationship with the founder. But So I, I kind of got an opportunity to learn the business side of being a freelancer. So it's not the, the technical side of delivering, as, as any entrepreneur knows, the being you know being in the business and delivering your stuff is only fifty percent of it. It's it's how do you sell, how do you market, how do you price, how do you position yourself, um, all of those things. Um, I got very fortunate that I happened to have a skill set in a sector that was growing, and so one of the the, the big decision points, the aha moments, I suppose, in this journey since two thousand eleven, was the decision to niche into one industry. Um, as a freelancer, you're always a bit that, – that, that's really quite scary because it's like what opportunities are you shutting down? And also the technology sector is a boom and bust sector, a bit like mining. Um, so obviously at some point the tap will turn off and what do you do then? Um, I think it was actually the Facebook IPO that gave me the confidence to niche into uh, one, one industry or one sector as a freelancing virtual CFO, um, mainly because – um, in boom and bust cycles, often there's one thing that will trigger the bust. Um, in the, free, uh, the the Facebook IPO, you know, the price listed, it tanked immediately. That was very predictable. Um, we had a whole bunch of investment bankers who made a lot of money out of that IPO. You know, it, the whole thing was a little bit dodgy. Um, and um, it, just from a perception viewpoint, it, sometimes it's those perceptions that trigger a downturn in an industry. And the industry just keeps sailing straight along, straight through. It's like, okay, clearly this sector has a bit of resilience this time around. So I think it was that decision. You're more effective from a marketing viewpoint if you niche into a sector. Uh, but obviously you've got to, you know, take the risk on the fact that if that sector dies on you for some reason, you've got to rebuild in another sector. Um, and so I think a lot of the, what I've learned in the last five years have... 
I've learned a lot of technical content around with the capital raising work I've done, you know, capital structures of businesses, how funding works with venture capitalists and private equity firms and all that stuff. I've, I've learned all of that, which is great. Um, but a lot of it's been more the relational elements of building relationships with investors who are then on the boards of these companies because um, that's where my leads come from. Um, and also just how you how you price, how you position yourself, how you do your marketing, um, all of those sorts of things. Um, the other thing, of course, is this sector happened to have a very large ecosystem that does a lot of network events. And so there was just a very natural ecosystem I could tap into and I just turned up to everything to start with. And you just you become known and familiar. Oh, yeah, she's a CFO. If you need someone to help manage your money, you go talk to her. Um, and so that's over the last five years, um, that in itself has been enormously valuable um, in terms of also learning just how to run a business um, outside of the – now, you'd think in finance, you'd need, you know, you, you do that naturally. That's true to an extent. Um, you learn how a set of numbers works. You learn how to put them together. You learn of what they mean about the business. That's very different to actually getting into marketing and sales and that sort of stuff. So I've learned an all, enormous amount about, about how to build a business through that experience. There's so much to learn when it's your own business and whether you're a freelancer or consider yourself an entrepreneur, the the technical side, the delivery of what you do and being an expert in your field, that's not the hard bit, is it? It definitely is. It's the marketing and the sales and keeping everything ticking along. But it seems as though you have now created a really good (laughs) ecosystem for yourself and your business as well with all of the relationships from not having very large uh, network when you return to Sydney to now um, just by putting yourself out there and becoming known as the virtual CFO here that it must be fantastic all of the people that you meet and the entrepreneurs and those who've got brilliant tech ideas who need to be put together with the right people as investors Um, it must be quite a buzz for you. It is, and I won't deny that. I, I do like the thrill. I've had um, I mean, tech startups have obviously a notorious fail rate. Um, I, my track record for what companies I've worked with is 100% on those who've raised money. Um, so that is, and th- there's a real thrill about doing something, which is against the odds. Mm. And now, early on in, in this interview, you said you're sure that I'm going to ask you what went wrong. Now, what are we talking about there? What went wrong at which phase in the career? Um, so it was when I left Sun. Um, so it was my first job back here in Australia where I wasn't working for Sun Microsystems. Um, I think it was it was a compounding impact of a whole bunch of things. Um, so I came back in April 05 and around Christmas of that year I started hunting for another job. And I, of course, thought with my international experience and depth of uh, my my resume and all the rest of it, that this would be a walk in the park and it would take two or three months and we'd be done. Um, I was wrong, horribly wrong. Um, So it took me, I think, seven months all up to actually get an offer that was even slightly, you know, to even get to the stage of an offer um, in a role in the first place. Um, That, of course, was deeply demoralising. Um, I actually sunk into a very deep depression for a while. Uh, my friends were, I think, were deeply concerned. Um, but, yeah, so it was, I think it was, that was the start of me learning to actually put value on those relationships and networks because obviously that was what I didn't have and I just assumed that oh, everyone will think she's a genius and she can get stuff done. Of course, we'll hire and we'll, we'll all be good. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Um, so I was oh, 33 at the time, so I was starting to hit that age where, you know, there's confidence and there's ego and at some point it, it gets cut and that was that for me was, was, was the beginning of, of learning my own, what's the word, humanity, mm-hmm. I suppose. You know, I'm, I'm not invincible. Um, and, I mean, I, I managed to carry through a big chunk of my career without ever hitting that one and I think we all hit it at some point. I hit it at this stage, which was when I was about 33. Um, so the job I, so obviously by the time I got an offer, I was pretty keen to take it. Um, I didn't really have a lot of options on the table and it was all, the culture at Sun had changed. Um, it used to be this amazing company that was very dynamic and growing and very encouraging of people to learn and to try new things. And that completely and utterly changed. The, the, the culture became an absolute nightmare. Uh, so people were leaving left, right and centre, that staying there wasn't really an option. 
Um, so when I took this role, um, I had looked for something which was a step up, but not too much. So I was a financial controller for a company called Hotel Club, which had been acquired by a massive conglomerate. Um, and with a view that it had a shared finance function and what that meant was there was lots of other finance professionals around me and there was people I could learn from and I could grow into this. And I was managing a team of 24. I mean, before that I'd managed a team of 10 and that was, that was the biggest. So I knew that the people management element was the biggest part. And that was actually my biggest surprise because I didn't think I was actually very good at it. Turns out that that was actually one of my strong points when I actually got into this, this job. Um, I still have people who work for me there who are still connected with me. Um, so when I, uh, between taking this job offer and actually starting, the corporate structure of this conglomerate changed. So they split it into four chunks and they put the travel bit together and they sold it to a private equity firm. Um, the day that transaction was done, and that happened before I actually started, they actually started taking all their digital online brands within travel and chunking them together to IPO them because uh, that was how they were going to maximise their value. So by the time I started the role, I was thought I'd taken wasn't actually the role I ended up with. Um, because of that, of these changes, the shared services function started to distance themselves from, from this group. Uh, so there was a lot of politics in that, and again, that all took me by surprise a bit. Um, so I started in this role in October. It was intense. Um, it was, you know, 70, 80 hour a week, hours a week, and I wasn't keeping on top of things. Um, and that was a real shock because that was the first time in my life where I felt overwhelmed, I suppose. Um, and then the absolute nail in the coffin, and this isn't a pun, I'm afraid, um, the managing director was very much a people person. He was a great guy. And I think if he got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in January and he passed by April, um, it was vicious. It was nasty. And so all of a sudden I'm completely and utterly on my own. Um, they put in a temporary C, uh, CEO, um, managing director, she was in her late 20s. She was the marketing person, very skilled, very capable, but she's in her late 20s. I'm in my early 30s and the pair of us are leading this company which turned over half a billion dollars that year with 400 people around the world. Needless to say, the panic attack started kicking in and all sorts of stuff. I went to a coach and they asked me the standard first question which was, so what's the worst that can happen? Well, I royally screw this up. This company goes bankrupt and 400 people around the world lose their job. And they went, oh, that is serious. And I went, yeah, it's why I'm here. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, now the second question they should have asked me, which they didn't, uh, was what's the likelihood of that happening? Obviously very low. Um, but, yes, I was in over my head. I was overwhelmed um, and I stopped sleeping for six months. It was, it was horrible. It was awful. Um, so towards the end of, and the other thing is they IPO'd this company and during, which is an inter, uh, a initial public offering. So it's when a company lists on a stock exchange. Um, and so they did that in New York. And so it's a six month process where money is no object. Um, you will get this project done and get it done now, which means that people can call you at three in the morning. I, I lost control of my calendar. Um, I could have people from New York call me and you had to get on a phone and call right now. By the time there was someone in the business, I'd bumped three times. I, I knew there was a problem. Uh, and th there's just nothing you can do about it. Um, it's just the way those processes work. So, um, yeah, so basically I was in a role which I hadn't even been promoted into. I didn't even officially have the title. Um, they knew they were going to hire the position once they had IPO'd. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, various things went wrong. Um, and it all, you know how these things snowball. Anyway, so... I had my annual review with my boss and um, he basically said to me, look, we're looking to obviously list this position. It was bigger than we ever first thought. You're very welcome to apply for it. My instant reaction was no, thank you. Um, so I took the redundancy. Um, so basically they gave me a graceful way out. I took it. I must say watching Tony Abbott last year, it looked very familiar because I actually was watching a man who looked completely overwhelmed by his job. Um, and he was offered the graceful way out and he, well, I don't think he did take it. So it's, you know, it was, I felt for him because I'd actually been there. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I was offered the graceful way out and I took it. And so I took a redundancy. Um, and that was, so that was when I um, um, went to Goodman after that. But I think the big thing I learned there, it was also just part of the learnings around the importance of the relationships and the fact that it's not your skills and experience that's going to see you through. I didn't realize that at the time. I just thought there was something horribly wrong with me because hang on, I'm meant to be able to do anything. Um, and all of a sudden it fell apart and that was, it was very confronting. 
Um, and it took me probably two or three years after that to actually figure out what really went wrong. Um, and it was very much around, you know, uh, building those relationships and that network and connections and, and all of those things. Um, so it was a contributing factor. Um, the other thing is when I went to this man's funeral, um, he was 50. He died far too young. Um, this was a man who was the managing director of a global group who employed 400 people and turned over half a billion dollars a year. There were 500 people in this chapel. I think work got mentioned for about five minutes. It was all about his family and his friends. And I looked at it and went, Rachel, what are you doing? Why are you killing yourself? <laughs> so, this is someone who got it right, um, who managed to figure out the balance. Um, and it was a real wake-up call. Yeah, that's it's, it's such a, a really compelling story because it. thank you for sharing that, Rachel, because it, obviously you were in so much overwhelm and wondering, you know, what to do next. But I guess the main thing is, is that you developed a great deal of self-reliance and resilience and you were able to, to bounce back. And I'm glad that you mentioned that um, the MD who did pass away, he had got it right because everybody knew what he, who he was as a man rather than someone who just worked um, yeah. because there must have been so much love in, in, the, in the chapel during that funeral too. Yeah. So it obviously must have made you have a bit of a think about the meaning of life and what's most important to you. And oh, yeah. so now you've reassessed and reinvented your career in a way and... Thank goodness you're doing what you do now because now you're benefiting all of these, you know, amazing startup technology businesses. May I ask you, what would you, what advice would you give to a new startup in order to give them the best possible chance for success? Um, so in terms of technology startups in particular, hmm. um, there's a methodology that's come out of Silicon Valley called the Lean Startup Canvas, which um, I've been involved with and, and have seen work. Um, the biggest thing of it is giving yourself the time and the space to figure out what's called your product market fit. Um, so people are very focused on their product, which to me is a reflection of who they are. And as opposed to their customer and what their customer's pain point they're solving is, and it's obviously then a reflection of who their customer is. And the, the, the people who are successful are the ones who actually manage to build a product that the technology may or may not be that compelling, but it's absolutely compelling from a customer's viewpoint. Um, I think what Steve Jobs did with around the design of um, the iPods and the iPads and all the rest of it was, was profound. And the reason is, is I don't know the technology in an iPod was particularly revolutionary. I, I, don't, I don't know, to be honest. Maybe it was. It was the fact the iPod had four buttons and that was it. And so you, therefore you did not need a PhD to figure out how to drive this thing as opposed to your remote control at home that had 300 buttons of it, of two of which you actually use. Um, so it's, I think that product market fit element is actually having a real empathy and respect for your customer. Um, it's not traditionally how we've learnt to build a business, by the way. Um, most sales and marketing disciplines are anything but that. Uh, one of the things I love about technology is it's actually changing that because the only way you can be successful in a tech business is to respect your customer. Um, so I think it's my, my advice to a startup tech founder is to not, tr not short circuit that process um, and to dive and dive deep into understanding your customer's pain point. Um, I think in services businesses, I mean, to be honest, it's the same thing. It's just your delivery vehicle is a bit different. Um, and understanding, yeah, don't, don't short circuit that process by which you need to understand who your customer is and what pain point you genuinely solve for them because it's not the one they'll tell you. Um, and then your marketing and your messaging and your branding and your positioning all needs to come from that, that sort of core thing that is the reason that your customer will value you um it also means you don't then you're having a value-based conversation as opposed to a price-based conversation which is always helpful mm. you're you're going to be the best person to have on side when anyone's thinking of really growing their businesses because you're absolutely right it's the customer experience and the user experience that's what companies need to think about because they're the purchasers in the end um and so that that's Fantastic advice from you. Thank you so much. Now, I'm sure that people will want to find out more about you, Rachel, and, and also see how you can assist them. So where can we find you? 
Uh, so I'm also a writer, among other things. Um, so I have a blog, uh, which is rachelwhite.com.au. Um, on that blog, um, I have things I've written for investors, for tech startup founders, for SME owners, and also for people who are just curious about how um, the financial system works. Um, so that's one place to find me. Um, the other places are on LinkedIn um, and also on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is Rachel CFR. Perfect. You know what I'm going to do? I conduct road to entrepreneurship workshops. And I think for anyone thinking of going down that route, you would be such a valuable person to approach and have a chat with. So I'm going to promote rachelwhite.com.au for all of that info that you provide as well. Plus, I'll put all of these links onto my show notes on janejacksoncoach.com so that it's easy for people to find you anytime at all. And so do you have any final words for us today? That's been such a fascinating uh, uh, interview with you Rachel what would you like to leave us with there's always more to learn um, and the learning party is actually exciting um, even on the days it doesn't feel like it well I'm totally inspired and I'm so lucky that we've had you on the show today thank you so much for your time and it's been great interviewing you Rachel thank you very much Jane it's been a pleasure to be here okay bye-bye bye-bye Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Jane Jackson Careers. There are over 180,000 book titles to choose, so give it a go and get your free audiobook today from audibletrial.com forward slash Jane Jackson Careers. You've been listening to Jane Jackson Careers. Sign up to receive regular career advice at janejacksoncoach.com.